Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Gabe Albornoz. I am one of the four at-large members of the Montgomery County Council. Uh, I am the proud son of two remarkable parents who are in the audience today, uh, Marisol and Marcelo Albornoz, who immigrated here from South America with their respective families some time ago. Uh, I am proud to be the third Latino to serve on this county council, the first to serve at large, and I am especially proud to serve alongside uh, one of my best friends, uh, council member Nancy Navarro, who has been a mentor and a guide on so many different levels for so many different years. And I want to acknowledge and thank her for being the co-lead sponsor on a resolution that we discussed before the county council this morning. And this resolution is directly in response to yet another attack on our immigrant community, certainly here in Montgomery County, but also across this country. Last week, lost in the just sheer volume of news was the Supreme Court's most recent ruling expanding the definition of public charge as defined by this administration. That expansion is already having a devastating impact on local communities, but will have an even more alarming effect and chilling effect in the years to come. What this administration has done both in their policy and in their rhetoric is let our immigrant community know that they are not welcomed here. And we are here through this resolution and the continued action of this county council and our county executive and our federal delegation and our community at large to let our community know that immigrants are welcome here in Montgomery County. And we are proud that they have chosen to make Montgomery County their home. Specifically, the federal regulation on public charge now states that a person who is likely to become primarily dependent on government services is considered a public charge. Under the revised regulation, an individual who learns, earns less than 125% of the federal poverty level, their age, certain health conditions, their English proficiency, their minimal background education, and a number of other factors can now be determined as to whether or not they qualify for the quote unquote public charge. Even more nefariously, it provides the ability for the federal government to project whether or not somebody will be on this public charge, which as we know, the appointees of this administration now facilitate and control this process. And so we can all do that math. Nationally, it's estimated that as many as 26 million eligible immigrants and their families may be dissuaded from accessing benefits pertaining to long-term health care coverage, affordable housing, and nutritional programs. And it's especially important to underscore that this is an attack on legal immigration. Legal immigration. Similarly, our own Department of Health and Human Services and the Primary Care Coalition have already, already reported, and as you'll hear from Dr. Crowell, impacts on county residents accessing public services. This creates a public health crisis for all of us when local community residents don't access the very basic care to ensure the safety, security, and health of their families, and especially of their children. Our immigrant population in Montgomery County represents 85 countries and over 138 languages are spoken here. Many immigrants are owners of local and small businesses and in Maryland, 67,580 business owners are compromised of immigrants that last year generated over $1.5 billion in revenue and, and tax income for the state of Maryland. So not only will this have a chilling effect potentially from a public health standpoint, but it will also potentially have an impact economically as well. This is an immoral time. What we are seeing is just unimaginable from children being put in cages, from all of these policies collectively having a devastating impact on the psychology of our community, it's having a very negative impact. And unfortunately, this is likely exactly what the administration wants. 
But what they don't realize with this short-sightedness and immorality is that it's going to have a devastating impact on our region and our entire country. Cesar Chavez once said, we cannot seek achievement for ourselves and forget about progress and prosperity for our community. Our ambitions must be broad enough to include the aspirations and needs of others for their sake, their sakes, and for our own. I mentioned my mom and dad earlier, most immigrants come to this country not traveling first class. And I wanna share quickly the story of my mom and her family who sacrificed so much to come to our country. Uh, they flew from Santiago, Chile to Miami, Florida, and then took a Greyhound bus for 24 hours through the segregated house to arrive in Washington, DC and connect with my grandfather who had been here for over a year establishing his first small local business. It was looking at the postcards that, oh man, that he sent them that, that, <laughs> made them realize they were in our area. We are here on behalf of so many families. that are under attack. And so I so proudly stand next to my colleagues. I'm sorry. I so proudly stand with my colleagues. And with that, um, we have representatives from our federal delegation that are here, and I want to thank and welcome them for coming. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague and one of my best friends in this world, Council Member Nancy Navarro. Mm -hmm. There is a particular... Um, there is a particular weight that some people carry. And um, thank you, my friend, mi amigo y hermano, council member Albornoz. Because there is a particular weight that some of us carry. And every single day we get up and we do our work and we do it proudly. But it's so difficult sometimes because when we allow ourselves to remember the faces the scared eyes, the children crying for their parents, the mothers who are separated from their children, the people in our own community that are sometimes afraid to come out and ask for help, who sometimes pull us aside and tell us and plead. That's, that's when we realize that we have gone off the rails. There's no doubt that that sense of humanity um, that has always made this country such a beacon has been eroded. And what you are witnessing today, in some ways you might say, hey, we've been here before, we've had other resolutions, and it's true. But my colleague said something very important. The noise is such that it's trying to make us somehow reject, get tired, become exhausted, and give up. We in Montgomery County are saying we are never going to give up. We are never gonna be exhausted. We will get up time and time again to stand up with our neighbors, with our families, to say enough is enough, and we will be there with you every step of the way. Because you know what? The facts don't bear out this entire hysteria. They do not. Immigrants have been scapegoated as somehow being the boogeyman out there for political purposes. We've seen it here in Montgomery County. We've seen how amazing Montgomery County is. And ladies and gentlemen, the immigrant community didn't arrive here five years ago. This surge of Latinos specifically started in the 80s as people were fleeing wars in Central America. And we are a better county because of all the contributions that our immigrant, immigrant community has made 
all of them, whether you come from Central America, South America, continental Africa, the Caribbean, Asia, we are better for it. So this hysteria, the facts don't bear anything out. What we need to remember with this particular decision is that it once again affects all of us. It affects all of us because we know the data shows that so many families are not accessing services that they have the right to access. We know that public health is a major, major concern for us. Have we been reading day after day and watching the news regarding the coronavirus? Well, I'm not exaggerating. There are healthcare organizations on the national level that are referring to this action as a significant concern as we're trying to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus. Do we not understand that when you step on one of your neighbors, it affects all of us? So that is why we are here. We are here because again, Montgomery County will have to pick up the slack, obviously, and we are here to send a message to the community that here in Montgomery County, not only are you welcome, but you are cared for and you should, you should, you should access the services that we have. Para nuestra comunidad, el mensaje que estamos hoy dando, que mi, conceja, mi amigo y, y compañero y hermano concejal Gabe Albornoz y yo, y todos nuestros colegas en el consejo, estamos aquí para decir que esta última decisión de las Cortes Supremas, donde están entonces expandiendo la carga pública, que esto lo que hace es más bien sembrar terror, miedo en nuestras comunidades. Estamos aquí para decir que en este condado vamos a seguir haciendo todo lo posible, como lo hacemos siempre, de apoyar a nuestra gente, de darles los servicios que necesitan, porque sabemos que esto es una decisión que no tiene sentido, que lo que está es allí para darle miedo, para sembrar el miedo. Y estamos preocupados, porque sabemos que hay en este momento una crisis de salud pública. Entonces necesitamos que todos ustedes estén pendientes y que sepan que en este condado ahí vamos a estar juntos. Estamos aquí con mis colegas en el consejo y también con el ejecutivo Mark Elridge para decir que aquí en el condado de Montgomery rechazamos el odio hacia los inmigrantes y estamos aquí para ayudar. Muchas gracias. I'm speaking on behalf of our federal delegation with a statement from Senator Van Hollen. I want to invite Jeff uh, to the podium. Thank you, Council Member uh, Arbernaz and also Navarro for your, your inspiration and your, your leadership, your inspiring words, your inspiring actions. Uh, my name is Jeff Samuels. I'm from Senator Chris Van Hollen's office. The Senator could not be here today, but he asked that I read the following statement on his behalf. The public charge rule is another example of this administration's continued assault on immigrants and communities of color. I am proud that the state of Maryland challenged this ruling, but deeply disappointed that, that the Supreme Court's 5-4 decision will allow this harmful provision to go into effect. I appreciate the efforts of Councilmember Albernoz and Navarro and wholeheartedly support their initiative. Congress must fix our broken immigration system and prioritize passing comprehensive immigration reform immediately. I will continue to urge my colleagues to take action on this issue, and I remain committed to helping everyone know their rights and access services they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. We're also joined uh, by Nina uh, Weisbroth from Congressman uh, Jamie Raskin's office, and uh, we also have a representative here from David Trone's office as well. Thank you all very much for coming. I, I now want to introduce our county executive, Mark Elrich, uh, who's been a strong champion of our immigrant community throughout his entire public life, and welcome him to the podium. So this is another one of those press conferences that no one wants to do. Um, we shouldn't be here having a press conference about this, but we have to be here having a press conference about this. Um, it is disturbing, this drive to dehumanize people um, for no other reason than they don't look like us and they're coming here and it's convenient because you're looking for an enemy. And, you know, the Russians are gone, I guess. <laughs> but we've got immigrants. And to just single out a population that, that works here every day, that starts businesses, raises families, is much a part of our fabric, you can't go any place in this county 
and not see the, the work in the presence of immigrants. And to dehumanize these people is just, you know, beyond the pale. And I, I really, you know, it's just hard to imagine how this can persist like this and why no one says no. I was watching something on TV the other night. It was actually in a movie, and it was a clip of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was giving a speech about immigrants, and he talked about that, you know, this dream of America for all Americans and for all those who come to America seeking that dream. That's Richard Nixon. How low do you go to get under that? I mean, it's... <laughs> It's, it's just astounding. Even he understood that there were certain things that were basic to our core values that America was this beacon that people would come to and seek a better life, and that was actually our normal expectation. And now we've gotten to the point that that's not a normal expectation. For, for all the flaws that America's had in immigration laws, for the most part, it was pretty simple. The people came here, they got jobs, they worked, they entered society, they did all the things everybody else expected them to do. They became citizens, they became Americans, their kids grew up like everybody else, and that worked. And why we can't go back to a simple acceptance of other people coming here and making it easier to integrate into society, not harder to integrate into society, is beyond me. But we're here. Um, my administration, we've filed, we've joined two amicus briefs, filed two amicus briefs in opposition to the president's actions and, and before the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, we're going to continue to be in the front of this. And as Nancy said, Montgomery County will pay some price for what we do. But if it's the right thing, you have to accept the fact that sometimes you have to pay a price. And I would rather pay a price doing what's right than to walk away from this problem when everybody else wants to walk away from the problem. So I'm really proud of what you all did on the council. I'm happy to be here with you. And uh, this just hope this great national nightmare comes to an end sometime soon. Uh, the former mayor of Gaithersburg proudly will always comment on the fact that he represents one of the diverse, most diverse cities in the entire United States. Uh, he is now our council president, and I'm proud to serve with him, Council President Sidney Katz. Thank you very much, Gabe, and, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, when we signed, when, when the county executive uh, signed the uh, Social uh, Justice and Equity Act, I got emotional that day. Um, and of course, I reminded myself that my friend, uh, Council Member Jawando, he and I were in an event one time and I got emotional and he gave me a hard time about it, then he started to cry afterwards too. <laughs> so emotion is a good thing, don't, don't get me wrong. But let me, let me just tell you that um, I'm somebody that my grandparents came to Montgomery County 102 years ago. My um, mother's side of the family, the Wolfsons, they um, opened a store in Gaithersburg, and I ultimately owned that store. Um, my mother was born in Gaithersburg, and, um, and I actually, my parents were living in Gaithersburg. I was, my parents had become very modern. My mother was born in a house, but my parents had become very modern. I was born in a hospital in, in Washington, but I came back to Gaithersburg three days later, or whatever, the, whatever that place, would, uh, that time would be. But... My, I am someone that has never moved more than three miles from where my parents were living from, when, from the time I've been born. But there's not a day that goes by that I'm not thankful that my grandparents came thousands of miles from Lithuania to Baltimore to Montgomery County for a better life. And if they hadn't, I would not have had a better life. My grandparents came, <clears throat> I'm getting emotional, John, Will. Uh, my grandparents came and opened a store, which I owned, and my grandmother, Wolfson, never learned to read or write English. She did not come here on an airplane. She came on a cattle boat. And from all that I know, she came here as a legal, 
uh, an illegal immigration, and she ultimately became an American citizen, but she never learned to read or write English. But I always tell people she learned how to count. She was a great business person. This country will suffer if we do not allow my grandparents and other people's grandparents and other people to come to this country. My grandparents employed people, they owned land, they owned properties, they absolutely were fine citizens. They had grandchildren and then children who became public servants, police officers, firefighters, people in politics. My grandparents came to America looking for a better life for themselves and for their children and for the grandchildren, and they found it. And I can tell you by this type of Supreme Court ruling, and, and the Supreme Court is just saying what the president can do in their opinion, a 5-4 opinion, but that's what they're saying, that this president would say that we are not going to allow people in this country to have a better life and to have a better life for other Americans is absolutely, in my opinion, un-American. This is a wrong decision, and this is something that we cannot stand for. We have to stand up against it. Thank you very much. So one of the blessings of now being a member of this council and for the last few years is uh, getting to become very good friends with Will Jawando. Uh, Will is the son of immigrants himself, uh, who's been a champion on social justice issues and so many issues, and it's an honor to introduce him now. Council Member Will Jawando. Thank you, Gabe. I have the unenviable position of going after all those emotional speeches, so I'm going to try to hold it together here. But um, really proud to be here, proud to be with my colleagues uh, who all have shared really personal stories uh, and with the county executive and with all our partners, you know, to just really push back against this public charge policy. Uh, the Supreme Court's decision is disappointing, to say the least. Um, I've said this before, uh, when the federal government falls short, which it's been doing a lot lately, uh, it's, up for the lo it's up to the local government and those of us who have this honor to serve to step up in the defense of our values of our county, our state, and our nation. Uh, and so I really want to thank Council Members Albernaz and Navarro for introducing this and, and doing that and stepping up. Uh, this action by the President is heartless and, and it's arbitrary. So adding our voice to the national debate is the right thing to do for the nation and for Montgomery County. We will go down in history on the right side of history. Uh, to s protect human rights, dignity, and the very fabric of the American dream. To be a nation with our shores that's open to the tired, to the poor, to the huddled masses, guarded by that mighty woman bearing a torch that throws a light of liberty upon the world. Uh, as Gabe mentioned, I'm the son of a Nigerian immigrant. There I go, Sydney. Uh, I got through a couple paragraphs, though. <laughs> Uh, my father left a war-torn Nigeria in the 1970s, uh, fleeing, searching for safety and for opportunity. Um, but I often say I, I wouldn't be standing here today but for that generous America that for centuries, not always, but over time has let people in seeking opportunity, like Sydney's grandparents, like Councilmember Navarro, like Gabe and his parents. But the blood that runs in all of our veins, I think this is really important, is equally American. Even though we've come from other places, that's what it means to be American, to come here for opportunity or to flee violence and to have the shores be open. So let's be clear about uh, what this policy is about. It targets immigrants, and particularly immigrants of color, and attempts to whitewash the great immigrant American story of accomplishment. We can't stand silent, by, why, stand silent while the president unravels the very fabric of our communities. It was mentioned four of the top ten most diverse cities in the country are in Montgomery County. We're in one right now. So we will raise our voices. We will object. And come November, I hope we will vote and get this insane person with these insane policies out of the White House. Tonight, President Trump will address a joint session of Congress to give the annual address about the state of our union. 
I stand here to say and stand here and say unequivocally that the state of our union is stronger because of the contributions of immigrants. Like Gabe's parents, like Councilmember Navarro, like Sidney Katz's grandparents, like my father. If this decision wasn't bad enough, just a few days ago last Friday, President Trump and his administration doubled down on his racist and xenophobic travel ban by adding six new countries to the list, including Nigeria, Africa's largest nation with over 200 million of the 1.2 billion people in Africa. It's also its largest economy. It's also residents that are here in the United States that are of Nigerian ancestry have higher educational attainment than Americans who were born here. Citing security concerns, he added six countries, Sudan, Tanzania, Eritrea, Myanmar, and Kyrgyzstan, all which, not surprisingly, have large Muslim populations, consistent with the intent of his first racist travel ban. And to even make it even further point, in the case of Nigeria, while restricting people from having a pathway to citizenship, he's still allowing people to visit, a loophole that makes no sense if you're concerned about security. But we've been here before, in 1917 and 1921 and 1924, immigration acts, in 1924 in particular, those were laws that cemented the nativist sentiments that we're seeing reemerge today and explicitly defined immigration in racial terms. The quota system except established by the Johnson-Reed Act, which was the 24 Immigration Act, subtracted from the total U.S. population all blacks and mulattoes, ending the distinction between the descendants of slave immigrants and the descendants of free Negroes and voluntary immigrants from Africa. It also discounted all Chinese, Japanese, and South Asians as persons ineligible for citizenship, including descendants of such people with American citizenship by native birth. By doing so, it excised all non-white, non-European peoples from its legal representation of the American nation and set us on this path. And here we are, 100 years later, witnessing President Trump and his administration reviving these failed racist policies with the majority of the Supreme Court's blessing, sending a message to everyone that's here about who they think really matters and who deserves respect. But this gives me hope because we're here, despite that history, to say that over the course of time, folks like Councilmember Albernaz and Navarro have pushed back against that rhetoric, against those nativist tendencies, and have allowed people like us to be here with the honor of representing this county and this nation. So we are doing our part in that long line of people who have pushed back against these policies over a long time to say that we are standing against this. This is not who we are, and we value everyone in Montgomery County. I thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, to talk a little bit about the importance of ensuring that our commu community continues to access uh, public health services that are so critical to our entire community is Dr. Raymond Crow, the director of our county's Department of Health and Human Services. So good afternoon to everyone. Um, I want to try to do this without succumbing to tears. So we'll see how far I get in this. Um, the first thing I want to say, you've heard from council members and from, from our delegates and from our state represent, federal representatives about this issue of public charge. So I will not go down that path exactly, but, but what I will say is this, that, that we have an obligation to fight racism in all its forms, every place we see it, in the streets, in in, at our southern borders where we see it, and in policy that we know is wrong, and public charge is wrong, fundamentally wrong, and we have to fight that. I, you know, seven months and a couple of days ago, I was given the opportunity and the honor and privilege of directing, becoming the head of the Department of Health and Human Services, and it is an honor and a privilege, and I appreciate it every day. So let me start by saying that Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services remains open for business to support the health and wellness of all, all, Montgomery County residents, every last one of them. I've got an incredible team of folks and providers and community members that are dedicated all across this county to help folks identify the programs and supports that they need to promote their health and to get them healthy and to help them stay healthy. And we intend to do that. 
We are required, it's important to know, by policy and by law to protect and safeguard the privacy of the people who come through our doors. So nothing that you say to us goes beyond our doors unless you give us permission to do that. It is important for you to know that as a community. We cannot share that information. There is a lot of fear and anxiety right now in the county and throughout the community and an anger in all of us as, as, as we react to the Supreme Court ruling. We are concerned, I am concerned, that, that fear will cause community members to disenroll from critical services that protect their health or, or, or seek or not seek to enroll <laughs> and, and get services that may be life-saving for them. My conversations with Montgomery County Public School officials tells me that they, have, they think they're seeing a drop and an application for free and reduced meals for children in the county. Um, recently, uh, someone came to HHS who has a green card and has had a green card for more than five years and is not affected by public charge. She came to inquire about benefits and after getting a good sense of what she was eligible for and entitled for, declined to apply for, her for those benefits for her family because she was afraid, even though her status does not, is not impacted by public charge at all. So she left her family's health at risk. Disease doesn't know race or ethnicity or immigration status, so that decision that she made out of fear affects all of us. Diseases will hop from person to person without regard of where they came from or what their immigration status is. We have to make sure that, that people know the facts to combat this fear. Knowing facts are critical, is critical to fighting this fear and to making good choices. This revised policy on public charge goes into effect on, on February 24th. So you have time to get information about how you might be affected, and I want to encourage people to do that. I'm going to skip the definition of public charge, but I want to say that, that it may or may not affect you. So before you react to it and make a decision, please get information about this. Public benefits that are affected by public charge include Medicaid, except for people who are under 21 uh, and or who may be pregnant, food stamps or supplemental nutrition assistance program, temporary cash assistance, and Section 8 and certain other kinds of federal housing. However, there are programs such as uh, a WIC, a nutrition program for in women, infants, and children, or MCHIP, health programs for children, or school lunches, as I mentioned earlier, that are not included in public charge. And folks need to stay engaged in those and get those where they need them. More importantly, our county programs, our local county programs, are not included in public charge. And I so want families to stay enrolled in programs that are not considered within public charge. If you're not sure about how this affects you, you have to ask us. You know, the role at HHS is to give you information about what you're eligible for and what you can receive that will help you support your health and the health and well-being of your family so that you can make a decision, an informed decision about what this means, about, about your choices for health. Please don't rely on rumors or stories or in you and you that you've made to make your decisions. Find trusted resources, whether they're advocates in the community or online resources like the, the, the National Immigration Law Center. They can tell you what is happening and what the rules are. If you need guidance, seek guidance from, from experts on immigration. No family should have to choose between risking the health and safety of self or family or risking their immigration status in this country. We've got to work through this and get through this. And I urge all of you who are concerned about this to get the information and get a plan. We have gotten through dark times in the past in this country, and we are going to get through this one, and there will be another day when this is not true, when public charge is no longer as backwards as it is today. So I'll end the way I started. The Department of Health and Human Services of Montgomery County is open for business to all Montgomery County residents. We are here to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Krull. Um, there are a number of organizations who are on the front lines trying to address this issue directly, uh, but one of the most impactful is Casa de Maryland. I want to invite Dr. Michelle LaRue, uh, who is the HHS lead for Casa, to talk a little bit about their work and ensure that the community gets the appropriate information. Dr. LaRue. Buenos dias. Oh, yeah, tardes. <laughs> Um, so yes, I'm here representing CASA, specifically our Health and Human Services Department. As you know, uh, we're over 100,000 uh, in members, so we're the largest immigrant advocacy organization in the region. Uh, and I want to start off by thanking uh, the county and the council um, for really taking charge of this. Um, being an immigrant myself, coming from uh, war-torn Guatemala um, as a young child to, to be uh, welcomed in this area um, was definitely 
literally life-saving for me and my family. Um, but I'll not say more about that because then I'm going to start crying too. <laughs> um, but the biggest um, message I want to get across about public charge is fear is Trump's uh, weapon. All this is is creating fear and confusion in our community. I mean, they purposely made this vague. If you talk about the public benefits that Dr. Crowell just mentioned, you have to have had a status to have been eligible for them to begin with. So this, you know, they're, they're throwing this out on purpose to make this very vague, very confusing. It is their weapon. That fear that they're creating in our community is their weapon. So our defense are the facts. CASA has been fighting um, this administration on a number of, of different ways and, and different topics like the travel ban that was mentioned earlier. Uh, we were at Dulles Airport at the very beginning of the fight for the travel bans, um, but we were also at the very beginning of the fight for public charge. We started in 2018 when it was first announced. Um, this, I don't know if you know, but public charge, the public comment period for public charge, no other public comment period had ever reached 100,000 comments, ever. Public charge comments got to 260,000. This is how much this is not wanted in this country. And we need to continue to fight back and the fight isn't over. We have a litigation amongst other organizations and other jurisdictions. There's over nine different juris uh, lawsuits against public charge. The fight will continue. Besides the public comment and, and the litigation that CASA is doing, we're doing a public campaign around this, educating frontline staff at different agencies, at clinics, anywhere and anywhere that we can get this known and really learn the facts, making sure that people don't disenroll. We're actively helping people enroll in, in public benefits, making sure that people don't disenroll when they are eligible. Because again, this is just drawing fear and confusion in our community. And we have just as many examples as I'm sure Dr. Krell has of when people are fearful and disenrolling when they really shouldn't be. And we have the right to take advantage of services that are offered to us um, and, and really protecting our health. No one should be questioning whether or not to enroll in SNAP or Medicaid just because they're fearful of this um, policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's important to note that this issue impacts all immigrants, not certainly not just the Latino community. Uh, with us this afternoon is Diana Conate, uh, the policy director from the African Communities Together. Diana. Good afternoon and thanks for having me um, and I'd like to thank the council members um, as well as the county for inviting uh, African communities together. Oop, thank you. Um, for inviting African communities together to be a part of this um, important discussion. Um, as was mentioned, I serve as the policy director for African Communities Together where I handle federal policy that impacts um, African immigrants. African Communities Together, also known as ACT, is an organization of African immigrants fighting for civil rights, opportunities, and a better life for our families here in the US and worldwide. ACT empowers African immigrants to integrate socially, get ahead economically, and engage civically by connecting African immigrants to critical services, helping Africans develop as leaders, and organizing our communities on the issues that matter. Given our mission, we find many of the policies coming down from the current administration to be quite alarming. Um, from the termination of TPS and DED to attempts to eliminate the diversity visa or to the most recent expanded travel ban, many of these policies have a disproportionate impact on African immigrants and their families. The public charge rule is no different. Um, it's essentially the public charge rule is essentially a wealth test that would exclude people from receiving green cards based on their social economic background. This will have a devastating impact on families throughout Montgomery County, including many African families. And just as much as this, is, this rule is a wealth test, it's also a scare tactic that has resulted in many families foregoing participation in certain benefits for which they qualify for um, out of fear of jeopardizing their immigration status. We remind our communities that one, most immigrants are already ineligible for benefits um, on the list as was 
just mentioned. Um, two, there are many public programs that are not on the list and will not be considered under the rule. And three, some categories of immigrants are not subject to the public charge rule, um, such as refugees, asylees, and TPS holders. In addition to making sure that um, our communities are armed with correct information about the rule, ACT has also taken other steps to fight against, um, fight against it, including joining several nonprofits serving immigrant communities last August to sue the administration over the public charge rule, and recently endorsing a forthcoming piece of legislation from Representative Grace Meng in the House of Representatives to remove public charge as a um, ground of deportation. And today we stand here in solidarity with the various uh, groups, organizations, and elected members or elected officials um, in Montgomery County, um, as well as those around the country, to denounce the Supreme Court's decision to allow public charge to go into effect. And with that, I thank you. Our final speaker is Agatha. Shmeduk Tan, uh, who is the staff attorney for the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center. Ms. Tan. Thank you so much, council members, um, the opportunity to be here today. Again, my name is Agatha Shmeduk Tan. I'm a, a staff attorney at the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center, very small legal services organization, nonprofit in Washington, D.C. I'm licensed in Maryland, a proud member of the Maryland Bar, and serve a lot of clients in Montgomery County. Um, I love the city of Gaithersburg. I regularly do client intake at the Gaithersburg Library, and it is a truly remarkable, diverse place. Um, we don't do a lot of policy, but we are on the front lines, and I wanted to speak a little bit and really put a face on who this is going to impact, and also just highlight, I guess, the benefit of and also the risk of going last. Is I'm so, so moved by everything that everyone has already said. Very. Thrilled to be here also with my colleagues from CASA and African American communities together. Um, just want to echo a few things and make sure that uh, people are aware of some resources that are out there, including the APLRC. We serve primarily the Asian Pacific Islander communities, but we will do consultations, um, free immigration consultations to low income immigrant families, if they have questions about the public charge rule and how this might impact them, we are, our services are open to you. I definitely also want to point out uh, one of the best places to find information that's um, constantly being updated is the website simply protectimmigrantfamilies.org. It's a part of the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. Again, that's protectimmigrantfamiliesaltogether.org. And you can find really quick fact sheets and information and uh, frequently being translated into multiple languages. So, as it's been said, this public charge rule change is really not a rule change, it's an entirely new rule. It is a wealth test on immigration, lawful immigration. When I think about our clients that we serve, I think about um, individuals that come to us that might have been survivors of human trafficking, and they got a T visa, um, domestic servitude, women from the Philippines, from Indonesia, from India, who were enslaved and found their way to law enforcement and found their way to us and were lucky enough to get out and escape domestic servitude and receive a T visa. They would be ex exempt under the public charge rule. But working hard in a low wage job like domestic work, now they have a T visa, eventually a green card, maybe even naturalized, become US citizens. They want a petition for their family members. They want a petition for their children um, who they have worked hard here to put through school have earned their high school diploma and now want to come here and have a shot at the American dream. They would likely be excluded under the new public charge rule change. Their hard work, their payment of taxes, their lack of a criminal background, all of playing by the rules, but the rules have just been changed on them. Who this will impact the most is uh, women. Women over the age of 62, because this, part of this wealth test is also looking at age. It's looking at educational background. It's looking at vocational background, how much you've worked in a professional setting. So that does not include being a homemaker, raising children, all the women's work that is so often not counted as real work. It's going to discriminate against them. So many immigrant families, once they establish themselves here, part of that American dream is family unity. It's bringing the whole family here for opportunity. Heard so many people speak about their backgrounds. Why do we do that? Because we stand on the shoulders 
of the generations before us. We have to acknowledge and recognize to give thanks. I too, not what I came here to speak of, but I, I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't speak of my own family heritage. My great-great-grandmother had the name Agatha. That's where my name comes from. I never knew her, but I remember her all the time, especially in the work that I do as an immigration lawyer. She came through Ellis Island from Romania, a domestic worker. Worked in New York for a while, eventually went to Chicago, opened a small bakery. The rest is history. Here I stand before you, the first of my family to ever own a doctorate degree. My mother is a naturalized US citizen. She was a survivor of domestic violence. There was a period of time in my youth when she was a single mom of three. We had we lived on food stamps. We, we had Medicaid. And she worked hard, and she was not going to be forced to have the false choice of putting food on the table or whether or not her immigration status would be jeopardized, putting food on the table for her children. So these are the kinds of families that are an impact. And this is why we have to remember that most, the vast majority of immigrants face, uh, the vast majority of immigrant families in the United States are hardworking, law-abiding, tax-paying individuals. And this public charge rule change impacts not just would-be immigrants, but lawful permanent residents and U.S. citizens. One of the, I think, most interesting articles that's been written so far, you can find in Forbes magazine, not usually a magazine that writes about immigration policy, but they call this the most consequential economic policy of this new administration and consequential in a detrimental way. We have essentially cut the American co uh, economy off by the knees because most families do experience upward mobility. Again, thank you. Um, so much more to say. It's an honor to be here today. And thank you so much for your leadership, um, Councilmember Alvaros and Navarro, for what you've done today. And um, proud to be in the struggle um, with all of you. All right. Uh, apologies for getting so emotional earlier, but this is an emotional issue and it impacts all of us, whether you're an immigrant in this country or not. I so proudly stand along my colleagues and I in particular want to thank my incredible team in my office and Lillian Cruz, Maida Bayonet, Beth Schumann, Joy Nurmi. Uh, this was an all hands on deck situation and by extension I want to thank Councilmember Navarro and her incredible staff as well who have been in this lucha for many, many years. We will continue to stand up for our community and we will continue to fight back against these immoral and unjust policies. So with that, um, I wanna close my comments in Spanish and then we will all be available afterwards uh, to answer any questions you may have individually. Um, este mensaje es para nuestra comunidad inmigrante de nuestro condado y de nuestro país. Uh, yo sé que estos tiempos son bien difíciles, pero estoy aquí para decirles que les queremos mucho. Les queremos dar la gracia por elegir a nuestra comunidad para promover sus familias. Estamos aquí para servir la comunidad entera. Si tienen preguntas sobre este tema y la legislación, no solo de lo que estamos hablando hoy día, pero todo lo, lo demás que está haciendo este presidente y este sistema de gobierno, por favor pregúntanos y trabaja con las organizaciones uh, que están trabajando cada día en la lucha. Muchas gracias, and thank you all very much for coming this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>